Hi, this is Dr. Bob Danhover, the public health officer for Douglas County with another of our COVID conversations. Now our first one for the year of 2023. And we're really pleased today to have with us Mitchell Kilkenny, who is our tobacco prevention coordinator. And he's got some great projects that he's working on. And we'll get to that after our COVID update. Well, if you have questions, please send them to us at... Um, Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. Again, that's Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. I know we're not doing this on Facebook, uh, but it works just the same. We have a great question this week about uh, about treatment of COVID, and we'll get to that in a bit. So the there is pretty much good news about COVID. So COVID is pretty quiet uh, everywhere in the world except China. Uh, there are some new variants out there, uh, but those new variants don't seem to be causing lots of problems. So in the U.S., the number of cases have been pretty flat over the last six to eight weeks. There have been some mild increase in hospitalizations, but really nothing like we saw last fall or last winter. Uh, what we're seeing on those hospitalizations is that uh, people who've had the bivalent booster, which is this new booster that's been out since September, are very unlikely to get hospitalized. And if people then do get the disease if they take the antiviral medicine Paxlovid, their risk of getting hospitalized is really quite low. So for example, today there are only five people in the hospital with COVID, one of our lowest numbers really since two years now. And so that is a very good sign. The new variants are interesting in that they change the surface proteins of the virus and make the monoclonal antibodies that we previously used much less effective. So you remember back during the time of Delta, we used the Regeneron. Over the last year, we've used the Beptilovimab, and neither of those work against the new variants because the surface proteins have changed enough that the monoclonal antibodies don't recognize that surface protein and don't help to neutralize it. So sadly, those were um, those were treatments that previously worked pretty well and don't seem to be working much anymore. The other things that we're worried about now is there's still a fair amount of influenza and a virus called respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, which are really circulating a lot. We're probably at the peak of both of those now, but they've really caused a lot of havoc over the last few weeks. Uh, certainly a lot of people know others who've had the flu. We've had a number of hospitalizations for the flu. And uh, with the RSV, it's peaking over the last few weeks. In clinic, we've seen lots and lots of cases. In fact, uh, we recently got a new kind of test and almost all of the tests were positive and they were true positives. There was that much RSV going around. You know, most kids with RSV won't get that sick, but little ones, especially kids in the first three or four months, and especially kids who have other issues like underlying heart disease, or they were preemies, or they have underlying lung disease, those babies really seem to be quite sick. And sadly, we've had a couple of hospitalizations for RSV and some kids who are really sick and are in the ICU. So RSV is still out there. So we need to worry about that, especially for young babies, especially for young sick babies. Influenza is still out there and COVID all at the same time, causing what we call the triple demic. I think uh, in Oregon, that kind of peaked uh, right around Christmas time and is starting to come down now, but all those diseases are still out there. And the very, very, very best thing you could do would be to get immunized against COVID and influenza for COVID. It's the bivalent booster. It's widely available in the clinics around town and in the pharmacies. It works great. We've not seen any untoward side effects. And then there's the flu boost, the flu shot. The flu shot, again, available at many clinics and in many pharmacies. It's a pretty good match to the circulating flu viruses this year. And so we strongly recommend that people go ahead and get both a flu and a, and a COVID booster. Unfortunately, there are no vaccines for RSV, so there's not much you can do to prevent RSV other than if you've got one of these young, sick babies, really, really try and limit exposures because um, that's the time that the babies are likely to get it from another kid who's sick with it. But in general, things with COVID are going pretty well. Things with influenza and RSV look like they have already peaked. So we're expecting a fairly good January. The question of the week this week is, 
uh, does Paxlovid still work? And the answer is yes, Paxlovid does work. So Paxlovid works by interrupting the cellular mechanisms uh, that support the growth of the virus. And so when these new variants come out, they typically change the surface protein or the spike protein on the virus. And that's why the, uh, that's why this, the monoclonal antibodies don't work. Uh, and why previous infection doesn't prevent you very much. But Paxlovid works on the internal mechanisms that don't change very much with these variants. And so Paxlovid is still very effective. There was a great study from Israel, uh, which looked at older uh, people who had COVID and were given uh, Paxlovid uh, for people 65 and above. It decreased their risk of hospitalization by at least two thirds. Uh, so that's great. It does not reduce hospitalizations very much in younger people because pe younger people don't get hospitalized very much. So you have to treat an awful lot of younger people to prevent a hospitalization, but still Paxlovid works. The bad story is that there was a national news story that came out earlier this week. And the headline was something like treatment for COVID no longer works. And so what should have been in the picture underneath that was a picture of bebtilovimab. Unfortunately, the picture they chose to put underneath it was a picture of Paxlovid. So if you were just skimming through, you would have inferred that Paxlovid no longer works. When you read the article, the article says it's the bebtilovimab that no longer works. Uh, but for people who just breezed through that or people who didn't read the whole article, uh, they may have gotten the wrong impression. So the good news is Paxlovid still does work. The only other treatment that really does work is the remdesivir, but that's an infusion over three days, really hard to do. So the first recommendation for people who are sick with COVID is to go ahead and use the Paxlovid. Again, Paxlovid, widely available. Many of the clinics have it. Some of the doctor's office have it. The pharmacies have it. And it is free to the provider. The government is still picking up the cost of Paxlovid. So um, that's a good thing. So we recommend that anybody who has COVID call their primary care doctor uh, and talk with them about whether you would be a good candidate for uh, Paxlovid. It does have some interactions with other meds. So sometimes you need to change meds. So for example, if you're taking a statin for high cholesterol, you may need to hold off on that for a few days. Um, so it's a little complicated, but that's why we'd have you call your doctor if you had it. Unfortunately, there are other medicines that have been suggested throughout the pandemic as perhaps, as perhaps helping. You remember early on, there was a, a question about hydroxychloroquine, then later about ivermectin. And I think the studies are now out on all of those, and they really don't seem to help very much. And some of the medicines do have some side effects. So we have seen some hospitalizations from people who um, took too much ivermectin. So we're, we're not recommending either ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. But if you are sick and in one of those age groups, you might consider getting uh, the Paxlovid. So that's where we are in COVID again. Pretty much good news on all fronts. China is still unknown. Um, but uh, for the rest of the world, things are going pretty well. So now let's cut to Mitchell. So I know Mitchell for many years now. So uh, Mitchell is a um, uh, is our tobacco prevention person. Uh, so Mitchell, tell us a little bit about your background. You're a local guy, I hear. I am a local guy, yeah. So I went uh, to Rosebrook High School, graduated here, went off to college, <clears throat> and I uh, came back uh, right around COVID time. So I worked with you with Aviva for many years, and then uh, decided to help out public health and do some of the vaccines and the vaccine drive, and then eventually found my way here in tobacco. Yeah, so Mitchell was an incredibly important cog in our COVID fighting machine. But as COVID goes down, many of those people who spend a lot of time on COVID are now working on other really important public health issues. So Mitchell, I understand you're the new tobacco prevention coordinator. That's correct, yeah. And we have lots of new programs going on. Um, and so, yeah, excited to share those with, with you and, and anybody else out there who's watching. Well, great. Well, tell us about uh, some of the several programs you're working on. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to share the Smoke-Free Pregnancy Program. So that is launching January 10th, so just around the corner. And that is a program for women who are pregnant or planning to become pregnant and who are also smoking. And whether that's vaping, cigarettes, chew, any sort of tobacco product, 
uh, would qualify you for that program. And so um, tell us how a, a doctor would refer somebody to this program. Yeah. So we have um, awesome referral forms. And so if there's a, a, a healthcare provider out there who would like to get their patients into this program, I would recommend giving me a phone call. So my phone number is 541-229-8987. And I will get you some referral forms. You can fax this over to us. And it's a little bit easier if you can sign your patient up directly like that. The other way is, uh, you know, if, if the patient themselves would like to, to sign up for the program, they can do that online. Just go ahead to Douglas Public Health Network and then uh, go to tobacco and their smoke-free pregnancies right on there. You can learn more about the program uh, and you can also register right there. So one of the great motivations for stop smoking is getting pregnant. So I know a number of young women who smoke and say, well, I'm going to smoke until I get pregnant and then I'll stop. So this is really a time where people are motivated to stop. So if there's a woman who is either pregnant and wants to stop smoking or is thinking about getting pregnant and wants to stop smoking before they get pregnant, how would they contact you? Yeah, the best way to do it is just go ahead and go on to that webpage. So Douglas Public Health Network and then uh, tobacco, smoke-free pregnancy. Uh, you can give me a phone call, talk more about the program, or there's a button right there that says register here. And you can go right. ahead and register for the program. The program is great. Um, it's a 10 week session and we'll actually earn rewards as you go through the program. So showing up for the program earns you rewards like maternal, uh, maternal care items, even uh, visa incentive gift cards. Cool. Uh, and then if you end up quitting smoking as well, there's more incentives for that. So it's a very strong program. It works very, very well. So you're saying that if you go in the program, you'll save money by not smoking, prove your health, prove the health of your baby and get and get some visa gift cards. That's exactly right. Yeah. So we encourage anyone, if you know someone out there who's, who's in the pregnancy and smoking and wants to quit, or if you are, if you're a provider, uh, send them over to us because this is a great program. It's one of the first of its kind, especially here in Douglas County. Uh, and we are very excited about it. Yeah. We have a fairly high rate of smoking and pregnancy in Douglas County. Do you know about what those numbers are? Yeah. So in Douglas County, when we just look at people who use, uh, women who use cigarettes in pregnancy, one in five women are, are using uh, cigarettes. The number is actually going to be quite higher with the, with all the vaping. And we're not quite sure what that is, but we know it's more than that 20%. So as a pediatrician, I know that moms who smoke um, have troubles in their pregnancy. Babies who are born to moms uh, who smoke are smaller, typically about uh, half a pound to a pound smaller uh, than the moms who don't smoke. So those smaller babies just have more issues because as you're smaller, you're more at risk for low blood sugar. You're more at risk for troubles in the nursery and it takes you longer to gain weight. And uh, most parents want their babies to sleep through the night and babies won't sleep through the night until they hit 12 or 13 pounds. So if babies are small at birth, uh, then it takes them much longer to get to the 12 or 13 pounds. In addition, the babies too get addicted to nicotine. And so you could definitely tell in the nursery which mom smoked because their babies were cranky as if they needed a cigarette uh, uh, eight to 12 hours after delivery. So uh, it really is great for moms not to use nicotine during pregnancy and to, uh, and to stop. And it sounds like your program is ideal. Is there any cost to the mom to join the program? The program is completely free. So no cost to the mom. And we have lots of... Uh lots of benefits too. So if you have other kids and you have no place to put them during that class hour, we actually provide some, some childcare for that hour. If you, okay. if you struggle for transportation, if that's an issue getting there, if you're on OHP, they have, there's programs that will actually pay for your mileage to get to the program. And also there is a, a non-emergency medical transport for the program as well. So there's, Please. yeah. The other thing I want to touch on a little bit is that we're non-judgmental. So I, this can be a really hard time. There's a lot of stigma surrounded if you smoke during pregnancy. And so we, we, we just want to have you. Uh, there's no stigma, no harm. We are positively uh, uh, focused. Great. I didn't think that's a good way to take it. So, you know, when I talk to a lot of, um, when I see kids, sometimes we'll talk to the parents about their smoking. And we really don't want to stigmatize cigarette smoking. We really just want to celebrate when people make that positive step to improve their health and to, and to stop smoking. So that's a great thing. So I understand you're also uh, working with Thrive on a, on a vaping program. Yeah, that's correct. So unfortunately in Douglas County, we also 
have one of the highest youth vaping uh, epidemics. So there's a lot of students, about one third of students in high school and middle school are, are using these vape products. Um, and so what we're working on is working on getting uh, classes in the schools. Um, and there's a, a three pronged effort to sort of help eliminate this issue. So one of the issues we see is very young kids using it. I had a kid in the office the other day who was 11 years old and was vaping pretty much throughout the day. She thought she took 50 or more puffs of a vape. And one, and one of the questions was, where do you get this? And it says, oh, you can just get it at any of the stores. Well, you know, vape products are not supposed to be sold to anybody less than 21. How does that happen? Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, the last few years, there's been very little enforcement of the minor possession of tobacco or, or the cells. And so we have uh, opened up this opportunity to opt into this tobacco retail license program where we can have a little bit more enforcement in our local stores and ensure that they are not selling to minors or anyone under 21. Great. Well, that's going to be an important thing. When will that start? So that's going to start around June. Yeah. Okay. So this summer we'll be starting to do those and trying to be sure that it's not easy for younger kids to start vaping because the vaping is really quite addictive. The vapes don't have smoke attached to them. They have this vapor attached, which is which contains nicotine, but nicotine is one of the most addictive substances out there. Uh, and uh, the problem, unfortunately, with kids is that they're easy to use, easy to use a lot of. They're fairly easy to conceal. There's no smoke at the time. And so this is a real worry about all these kids who are vaping, especially the very young, because young brains are much more easily addicted. That's right. We've even had reports of second graders beginning to, to use vapes um, and so we're, we're really all over this, trying to every, every avenue we can to help eliminate this problem. Well, we're so excited that you joined us as the, our tobacco prevention coordinator. I want to thank you for all of the great help that you gave us uh, during the vaccine efforts. Oh. And so we'll see you again this summer, I think, uh, when we can get an update to see how the, the pregnancy program is working and how this tobacco retail licensing program is going to work. So thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate your time.